Okay, uh, Suresh sir, at your permission, we are good to start. Yes. Okay, we are good to start. Good evening. Thanks for joining us today uh, uh, for the Thursday night talks. I know it's a holiday, long weekend, and thanks for taking out your time for joining us today. Uh, today, we will be having a, uh, a almost the last TNT of this month. But before we move forward into our session today, I want to take this moment to thank our annual sponsors, namely Brightcom Group, Controllers, Voxen University, Athena Global, Dallas Venture Capital, Fujing, Cooper Labs, Lowstro Advisory, StatCap Advisory, Eham, Ezone, Finvista, and Jupiter Alternative Investive Fund. With no much details, uh, can you go on to the next slide, Sandeep? Uh, some quick guidelines to all our participants. Your request, you will, However, we'll not be able to access your microphones and cameras, but if there is any question or answers, you can reach out to the host and the chat option is disabled in the best interest of, Sandeep, can you go back to the previous slide? The chat option is disabled for the best interest of the program. So we will be enabling it at the approval of our moderator for today. And the moderator will take the questions for all the panelists. And if you have any other challenges in attending the program, you may reach out to the host. With that said, we will start with the session with no much delays. Today we will, next slide please, Sandeep. And today we will be having a discussion in partnership with T-Hub about entrepreneurship is a vital part of growing India, right? And we have wonderful set of speakers and wonderful set of moderator. It's, it's a, he's a wonderful moderator. Uh, I was just seeing some status of our fellow entrepreneurs from our associate member, Group who are sharing about Wikipedia link about a speaker, but I won't do this honors. I would request our president, uh, Mr. Suresh Raju, to in introduce our moderator for today and take this session forward. Suresh, sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vamsi. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this talk today. And uh, thank you to all the speakers and the moderators for joining in this session and really looking forward to it. Uh, Dr. Srikant Sundarajan, I think needs no introduction in the Hyderabad uh, ecosystem, a general partner with Venture East, a fund that has been around since 1997, one of the long-standing venture capital funds in India, which manages about 300 million plus of capital and has been an investor in many of the startups, both in Hyderabad and the ecosystem of India. Uh, Srikanth is a very active angel investor and has been uh, part of many startups and has contributed both from a capital perspective and also with his advisory services. Uh, he, to me, he's a guy who is actually a great connector of people. He can connect any two dots very cleverly and make sure that there is value created for everyone. A lot of appreciation for him in the entrepreneurial ecosystem for all the gyan that he provides and all the advice and also the sincere uh, effort he puts in helping startups. So on behalf of the entire ecosystem, thank you. And uh, Srikant, look forward to having a wonderful session uh, with you. Thank you. He's a seasoned entrepreneur and I think brings a lot to the table, especially around the technology investments. Srikant has taken time along with two other authors, Sri Pandey and Shivani Shashin, to write a wonderful book on the IITM Nexus. It has 16 journeys that we all can relate to to inspire the next generation of students to pursue entrepreneurship. The stories in all of these begin with their journey into the undergraduate college and how they have evolved into being entrepreneurs who have successfully built large businesses. From Desh Pandey to Sridhar Vembu, the story of Vinita Singh really connects instantly to many people, right? Thank you, Srikant, for bringing all of these wonderful journeys into the world here and look forward to your next book, The Success is what we all look at, but all the struggles that these entrepreneurs have gone through and their journeys, I'm hoping really, uh, I think uh, inspires people. It's a must read book. It's available on amazon.in and highly recommended for all considering entrepreneurship, especially the folks who are in students and our first, first generation of entrepreneurs. With that, I want to hand over the conversation to Srikant and request him to first talk about what inspired him to write this book? What is the genesis? What led him to do this and take it out from there? Thank you, Srikant. Thank you, Suresh, for that warm introduction. I hope uh, you folks are able to see me. 
So this book, which we, yeah, this book which Suresh was talking about, actually uh, is very near and dear to my heart because I had a stroke 13 months ago and I didn't know what to do. Uh, normally, I'm a very active person and I needed to do something. And a couple of students, uh, uh, Suresh Pan, uh, Suresh who's not yet, like, uh, Sri Pandey as well as uh, Shibani approached me, saying that why won't we? Why can't we write a book about all these wonderful stories? And so that got me thinking. And while I was lying in bed, I started scribbling some things down. Then I got onto a wheelchair. Then I started walking. And these kids inspired me to put these things together. And I also want to thank all the entrepreneurs, uh, many of whom I know right from the early days, who actually helped with the book too. So this book belongs to everyone. And all the proceeds of this book actually goes back to a good cause. It goes back to STEM education for the girl child in high schools, as well as entrepreneurship programs. So we don't keep anything. So thank you very much. And do spread the goodwill. So now, uh, I, ju I just wanted to kind of uh, briefly introduce our panel. And, uh, and all of these people have some uh, kind of uh, some kind of connection to Hyderabad. Let's, let's talk about Heyman, right? Uh, I met Heyman in 2016. He's also a uh, graduate from IIT Madras. And he was working on some very cool stuff at that time uh, because AR and VR was just starting out. And he was actually trying to figure out how to do remote diagnosis and remote training of uh, four corporates who had complex kind of equipment, right? And it was very difficult to kind of diagnose what was going on on the factory floor from uh, the diagnosis centers. So how would you kind of create a live interaction? How do you get things going? And he had a number of kind of demos going. And I think uh, Mercedes Benz in Germany was also trying it out. And he got his first round of funding. And more recently, when I connected up, he has actually transformed his company into something fantastic along the lines of Meta, Web3.0, blockchain, NFTs. So what, whatever he's going to spin up next is going to be really wonderful. So thanks, Hemant, for joining us. Thanks, Hemant. Our, our next speaker here is basically Mr. Narsimha Reddy. And I know this company really, really well because his co-founders met me immediately after they graduated from IIT Kharagpur. And one way or the other, I've been actually involved with quite a few of the rounds of their early rounds of their funding. And I think the last round they raised was uh, close to about $500 million in valuation. They are a marketing automation SaaS company, uh, usually a very difficult play to kind of come out of India because of it's very crowded. But I think they are a wonderful team. Narasimha manages all their finances, even though he was a B-Tech and biotech, but he loves finance. And his co-founder, Ravi, is, uh, Ravi Teja, is very, very good at uh, sales marketing. And Yash, who is my favorite, is their CTO. I've had a number of discussions early on on how to scale their architecture. They've, they've done a phenomenal job. So thank you, Narasimha, for joining us. Thank you, Shikant. And Kedar is the most important speaker here from my perspective, because I met him when, in 2011 when he was actually a student doing his first startup inside IITM called Lemma Labs. And these the kids who are doing Lemma Labs and eventually who joined Hyperverge are all phenomenal people, right? And uh, they had a passion, they had a vision, they wanted to do something around AI, they wanted to do something around vision, they wanted to do something around NLP. And it was uh, obvious that they would kind of form Hyperverge. Uh, and they went through enough kind of uh, uh, pivots, as you might call it, but I call it basically discoveries. Uh, they started off as a B2C play uh, with, where eventually they ran into competition from Google. So they had to take a step back. And the beauty of this company is they actually took a step back and said, we won't take any more funding. So I was uh, lucky enough to have had gotten permission from Helion to invest in them as an angel investor. And uh, so the character of this team is phenomenal because they've actually bootstrapped it and also been influenced by Sridhar Vembu, who's another entrepreneur from IDM who we fe featured in the book. So this is actually a very phenomenal journey. And as we kind of go through this, we will ask Kedar to talk a little bit more because it's best it comes from his, uh, <laughs> from his side. So thanks a lot, Kedar. Thank you, Shrikan. Great. So rather than doing some round robin stuff, which is what people usually do, and basically after my stroke, I think I'm no longer an engineer just like you, Narsama. So I want to go back to you. I want to, I want to find out 
why you chose biotech i mean obviously there must don't give me a reason saying that you took biotech because that nothing else was available okay and the other thing is why did you choose madras when the other two co-founders went to kharagpur thank you thank you shikant and thanks everyone for having me um i think it was predominantly lack of knowledge back in those days i think uh, everyone um, so there was there was only one iitm guy from my village where i come from uh, so someone who passed out in 2006 i don't know if you know him as well someone called she his name is shri nath if you remember right so he was electrical in iit madras he was i think probably top 100 ranks in iit and chose electrical in iit madras and when i was speaking to him um, while he has no knowledge of biotech i think he probably pushed me to take biotech assuming there is a lot of scope for it so i probably kind of wished the engineering seat back in iit madras when i chose biotech because in first year itself it was very clear to me that i was not going to do this uh, after the college right so which led me to kind of go for all the other finance courses within the college i'm glad that IIT Madras did have options to take multiple courses that you wanted to take, uh, but uh, it was probably uh, nothing that I had known about biotech. To be honest, it was just one, probably one or two persons pushing me that there is a lot of scope for biotech, and uh, ended up there uh, with having no knowledge of what it is. Thanks. I think you're always candid as al- always. Uh, that's what we we like about you, <laughs> and you're very very accessible. So I think. uh to the audience i think all the panelists here are very accessible and you should kind of try to reach out to them in the future um uh, now we're talking about college kedar i'm going to jump um uh, to you and ask you a very uh, kind of convoluted question what prompted you to do a startup when you were in second year or third year of uh, btech a full fledged startup i mean how did that happen was it was it the people around you was it you so i think uh, i would like to have a better and a more interesting story than this but it actually was a couple of seniors who called me to ganga hostel and said we are going to do this and we want you to take up this part of it and there were 11 of us i remember at that time who said yeah we are all excited and i think for the six first six months we would just meet at himalaya mess and keep discussing things and uh, we did not really do anything and then by the by the end of six months only three of us were left uh so yeah so honest answer is uh, i was a part of the team that was representing iit madras and india in robotics at that time uh, in a competition called iarc so uh, a teammate of mine just called me and he had an idea that you know why don't whatever is available to us at cfi can we not make it available to a whole lot of other students who are maybe as smart but did not crack je for whatever reasons uh in colleges right outside iit madras there are so many brilliant students out there can we make this accessible to them uh, i always found that uh, that uh, mission statement very meaningful and uh, instantly bonded with it yeah so one important uh, point that kedar makes is this is not all about iitm it's basically starting a movement which basically starts growing and in my selfish interest i want hyderabad to grow because i went to high school here and i'm back here this is this is my town and i wanted to flourish because it's got all wonderful components of the ecosystem it's got the iits it's got a fantastic business school it's got a law school it's got research facilities it's got industry so i i'm, I'm hoping that uh, this snowballs into something which is very very impactful uh, for the ecosystem as as kedar was pointing out so kedar one more thing right you did lemma labs and then you came out and it, there were a bunch of you right i don't know how many of you were part of it, it was it another 11 people in hyperverge uh no hyperverge fortunately we did not repeat all the mistakes we did at lemma lab so we started out as a founding team of five people and we have been five and uh, we have a very strong core team all iit madras in fact the all the early teammates are all friends etc that we knew uh, who do great work and that we who who are the only people who would probably trust us at that very early stage who did not sit for placements and joined hyperwork so we have a strong core team uh, of you know friends now colleagues uh, that that came from alma mater this is brilliant because because uh, one thing which is which we have to underscore is that early bonding important thing to underscore the kedar's journey is those five people are still together i'll come back to the uh, that point a little bit later as we uh, let, let me move on because i don't want him to feel isolated here 
Hemant, uh, yours was a very, very interesting story because you were actually on the cutting edge of technology and AR, VR was just about to happen. There was no web three or there was no standards for AR, VR. How did you actually happen to uh, kind of uh, first select the area and then of course, uh, the early struggles that you faced with that? Right, right. Well, uh, so well, my path was uh, partially what uh, on, on the same lines like Narsimha mentioned, right? Uh, it, it all started from the time I picked up a branch in Nairi Madras. Well, you know, sorry to say this, but I picked what was left for me, which was mechanical engineering, uh, right? Uh, and then went into mechanical and I wanted to do something uh, beyond mechanical or rather something more, which is more of my passion, which is computer science and medical at the same time. So I took up uh, biomedical engineering as a minor in IITM. Well, passed out from IITM, you know, not sure what to do. I I applied for uh, supersonic combustion research uh, in areas for masters. I could not get in. Uh, I was a seven pointer uh, in IITM. Uh, you know, I could not get in. I mean, of course, there is this whole rule book which you have to follow. You know, seniors apply here. You should not apply there. Blah blah blah. All of that, right? So anyway, uh, I worked for a uh, the software firm in India. Uh, I still wanted to do something which is uh, an intersection of mechanical engineering, the four years of effort and computer science, right? Uh, so there are only two fields that uh, came up. One was robotics uh, for my master's choice. The second was virtual reality. So that's how I ended up in virtual reality. So I, I picked up master's at Sunny Buffalo in mechanical engineering department, as opposed to what uh, general notion is that VR, AR means computer science, nothing to do with mechanical, right? Hey, why did you ab abandon mechanical? So it was actually uh, in the you know in the in the mechanical engineering department at Buffalo where my journey of VRA started. So my incidentally my thesis during my master's was in liver surgery. So I you know I, would, I was able to tick that box of medical. You know a lot of people I know uh, you know would have thought hey should I take medicine or should I take engineering right? So uh, so I happened to sort of work in the VR space and in fact AR space uh, for my project work thesis work work which involved liver surgery as well. So this is how it started. We are a journey in 2004. Uh, yeah, a lot of transformation, uh, you know, and ended up uh, in the matter of days where we create a multi-user VR AR account sensing solution. Thanks, Evan. So actually, the interesting thing that you underscore here is everything is devolving into basically an interdisciplinary kind of solution, right? Whether you talk about health, health tech, whether you talk about uh, robotics, if you talk about even manufacturing Ford Auto, it'll have elements of software, it'll have elements of hardware, it'll have elements of traditional sciences. And uh, so I think uh, this is a message out to the students at least and to the anyone from academia that I think if this is encouraged, it also actually provides a very decent impetus to entrepreneurship. And that's basically what's happening all over. I mean, I'm beginning to see that in IIIT Hyderabad, I'm part of the CIE. So I think more, more of these things should come along. So Hemant, what, what, do you, what do you think the view of the world is tomorrow? Like Web 3.0, Meta, uh, AR, VR, NFTs, blockchain, where's, where's it all going? Yeah, uh, well, I think there is a need to have a, uh, have a solution which is better than right now, which is binary, right? Either meet in person or meet on Zoom, right? Uh, so that's, that's how people meet. Right, uh, but there should be uh, something which is uh, which is probably another medium which is better than uh, at least the 2D medium that we are in right now. So I truly believe that the the future is where we would see at least my uh, vantage point. Right, is is a medium where people could see a lot more information on on the real uh, you know world that they are familiar with that they are seeing. So which is basically where which is augmented reality where people would see a lot more information on the you know, in the real world, uh, vis a vis with the ability to connect with uh, their family, their friends, their colleagues uh, who could be elsewhere. So these hybrid meeting spaces using augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, you know, I'm about as the future, uh, you know, around which there's a lot about, uh, you know, NFTs, uh, you know, where different goods can be transacted, uh, block, which is powered by blockchain, everything will come together to make it much more powerful as a new way of uh, interacting with, uh, you know, different people. Wonderful. I want to use this as a baseline and flip over to uh, Kedar now. Kedar, I mean, uh, you found phenomenal success in doing a lot of uh, AI, NLP, machine learning around KYCs for financial services uh, organizations. If you were to bring some of the concepts that uh, Hemant was talking about into your world, 
How do you think KYCs will happen tomorrow? How do you think customer relationships will evolve in financial services institution? Have you lost Kedar? Yeah, Shrikant, sorry. <clears throat> One of the huge trends that we are uh, seeing, Shrikant, is identity is becoming a very important layer. Like in metaverse, for example, right? What prevents someone from taking over you as an identity? If you remember back in college days, there would be this one person who would make identity of another person and you know we'll uh, that would be a facebook profile that everyone would troll and whatnot and all of that so you know as we move into virtual world i think the concept of identity becomes even more important uh, and today we are seeing that this concept is moving out of financial services where you know it was a regulatory requirement that you have to do an identity verification if you're transacting money Today, we are seeing it happen in so many different areas. It's happening in gaming. It's happening in all areas that we never imagined, right? Like today, be it Swiggy, be it so many different companies that we never thought is our customer set are starting to use identity. Uh, so I definitely see that identity being a very important cornerstone uh, in terms of protecting people, right? In virtual worlds, uh, that that is something that I can say. The, the other thing that uh, underscores right all of this is finally when we talk about identity or anything it is about trust right if i am going to go somewhere and i'm meeting somewhere right the in the real world there are many many ways in which we develop trust or there are many markers or proxies that we use to trust right like uh, if someone introduces me to if shrikant introduces me to someone there is a natural trust that i have on that person right because the introduction is coming from shrikant so it would be very interesting to see how these things move in the uh, in the virtual world identity or anything that we talk about right finally if we take a step back it is all about trust right are you able to trust the person and trust is very important in terms of any kind of transactions to happen be it monetary or any other kind of transactions that happen between individuals trust is like an underlying layer that makes those transactions safer I to totally agree with you. I think uh, just like we're talking about financial services, uh, I don't know, is Kiran, Kiran Kalakuntla there? You just put up your hand if you're there. He's not in the audience. Okay. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. So basically, I just wanted to tell everyone that um, Ekin Care is another uh, company of ours where we invested in as Venturis. They just raised a $15 million round. Unfortunately, I couldn't disturb him to come here because he was busy with the paperwork, but it came out today. But I can talk a little bit about healthcare, just like Kedar was talking a little bit about how trust needs to, be, needs to happen. Similarly, when you're talking about these virtual meeting rooms where you're going in and doing a patient doctor consultation and there's AR, VR, where at the tap of, or with a gesture, haptic gesture, or maybe a tap of the screen, you're able to kind of exchange records the whole experience is going to change. You don't have to go in and basically stand outside any, anyone's office. It's just going to be all virtual. And that's basically another thing where trust becomes very important, data becomes very important, just like what uh, Kedar was alluding to earlier. Now, let me hop on to uh, Narasimha. Uh, one of the biggest challenges of building a global SaaS company out of India is basically business traction outside India. Inside India, you, always, you all already have customers, but they're somewhat kind of... Uh, I won't call them painful, but it takes a long time for you to sell to them. And basically your margins are a lot lower because obviously the ability to pay and discover it. How did you actually break that myth? What happened? I mean, uh, because you, you joined a little bit later and that's when the real growth started to happen. So what was basically the thing that changed that situation? Yeah, no, that's actually, that was a myth uh, by all the investors as well back in 2015, 2016 before we started scaling a lot of other companies started scaling so it's a good question Shikan. so uh, if you look at uh you know i think in our space uh we were revenue generating tool for a lot of companies so we basically help consumer companies generate incremental revenue by personalizing their communications across uh, multiple touch points right so uh, it was really important for us to establish the value prop and each market behaves differently so while we started in india as you rightly said back in 2014 2015 there was inherent mobile drive that's happening and there were no tools back then existing in the market which were helping the consumers or customer companies uh, to engage with their users through mobile channels. I think it was a sweet spot for us back in India. And uh, we educated the market that while in the 
previous decade, uh, consumer companies was using email as a tool to engage with customers. It was really important for them to use mobile channels as a tool, be it mobile push notification or notifications that you can see on the mobile app as an important tool to increase revenue from their users, right? We were educating the market, market back in 2014, 2015, and a lot of customers were facing this challenge and it was easy for us to kind of get into um, uh, the customers uh, easier. Then when we moved to other markets, especially Southeast Asia was the next market after India for us. Uh, we started back in 2016, uh, very early. I think a lot of companies now, I think Kether, Kether's company, Hyperbudge also derives uh, significant revenue from Southeast Asia, if I'm not wrong. So uh, Southeast Asia was an important market for us. It took a lot of time for us to, again, I think trust also becomes a factor here in the market when you are not originally present and trying to make a presence there. Uh, we spent more than one year probably just educating uh, these customers on how they can leverage tools like us. So I think a lot of education uh, because every market is different. US is probably more matured. Uh, South Asia was less matured compared to India back in those days. So we took very lean approach, but at the same time, we did a lot of events. We did multiple events and multiple in-person meetings with some of the top customers. So uh, we felt it was important for us to believe, uh, to, to have some of the top customers in South Asia believe that we can deliver value to us, right? So we focused on top 15, 20 brands in South Asia to begin with, because we did not have enough uh, capital also to spread and pray uh, some, some, some customer will come on board, right? So we went very lean, just two people in the first year, spent a lot of time with the top 20 brands and got on board at least seven or eight of them. That kind of helped us just to expand it from there on in Southeast Asia, right? And, and uh, it was important to have those brands uh, having trust us and having seen the results. We were able to immediately get case studies with these brands and that kind of became a flywheel over a period of time to help generate multiple clients and multiple revenues for us. Today, just in Indonesia, we have more than 100 clients in, and probably South Asia put together, we'll have probably 200 clients uh, overall. So, and obviously our deal sales are a little higher than a normal general SaaS companies from India, which is great for us. And, and again, other markets are different. I mean, I can go on for a long time, but US is completely different market, as you rightly know. Uh, it was It is much more mature, it's much more important for us to establish why moving it compared to others than the need of the tool, right? Like it was completely different ball game, ball game altogether. I, I think these are wonderful points. I remember being in the board meeting a yeah. few few months after you joined and I was the one who said, why don't you double down on Southeast Asia instead of focusing yeah. on, I think, uh, so sometimes, I mean, this is just basically another point to the audience. Sometimes you might be better off establishing a leadership position in a, in a geo where there is growth, get to the top 20 clients there because they, they act as influencers, doesn't matter where you go tomorrow because the, the whole world is a lot tighter today. So you will get a lot of good references from say Singapore, say Malaysia, all the way back to the US or even Europe or even Japan. So all these things are kind of critical uh, because a lot of people spend a lot of time saying we want to go straight to the US without exposure. Uh, I can say that all some of the other SaaS companies that we have invested in, we've made some mistakes like that where we had to spend a lot of time hiring and uh, it's not that easy. So uh, thanks for pointing that out. Now I'm going to um, bowl you a googly since uh, you're a finance guy. How did you arrive at uh, the pricing model? It's a <laughs> good question. It's a long drawn topic probably, but I'll try to keep it simple. So when we started, I think uh, multiple companies were uh, coming up with multiple models. Um, the predominant model back then was something called events. This is basically nothing but so since we track the user behavior of multiple companies that we work with. Uh, so every action that a user does in mobile app or website or any other touch point is passed as an event to the platform, which is more engaged, right? So. A lot of companies, like let's say, be it mix panel or amplitude. Uh, so these guys were pricing based on events, which is nothing but the actions that you know users that we were tracking uh, as a platform across multiple touch points, and that was very aligned towards cost. 
So your cost is typically dependent on a lot of actions that you typically track. But if you want to go and do a value-driven approach, so we were trying to see what is the problem that we were solving. We are trying to solve retention for the companies. What does retention mean? It means increasing the DAU to MU ratio. It means increasing the monthly active users. So why not? And we were looking at this metric. While we were looking at this metric, we saw a correlation between MU and events, uh, which is again a cost metric. So for every user, there is an average number of events that people track or uh, companies like us track. Right? So while we derived cost from event as a metric, but we went and gone ahead pricing our product based on MEUs. And we were fortunate that that actually has been the same for the last eight years. There was no change. We got it right at the first time. Uh, I think very few companies probably will get it right. Uh, and we are really fortunate to get it right. So wonderful. We... wonderful to recognize that sometimes luck has a <laughs> spot to play, you know, not to keep discovering. Uh, I want to jump on to Kedar here for a minute. Uh, Kedar, you've always be prided yourself being a tech company, more B2B now, I, I know you started off as B2C, uh, but at some point in time when we were transitioning over, you went through a really hard time where you'd run out of all your angel funding and you folks made a conscious decision not to take any more funding, but to bootstrap. And uh, Sridhar Vembu had a huge hand in this in terms of actually uh, kind of mentoring you. Can you just talk us through a little bit of that? Very long story. I'll try to articulate it. Um, so, Shrikant, the, the fundamental of this story I got connected to in Lemma Labs. Uh, I always, you know, everyone thinks that we discovered this at Hyperwork, but I personally, as an entrepreneur, discovered it at Lemma Labs. I remember a day at Lemma Labs, very limited. I think we had like two lakhs in the bank account. And I, you know, I would, I would travel to very, very far away colleges, carrying robots and carrying a lot of sheets of paper. And, you know, we were we were doing a course for middle class students. So it would be 2,500 rupee course or 5,000 rupee course for a six month program. And, uh, and I had a consulting job, I had a Beria job. So this was after not taking up that. And I remember going to a very far away college in Chennai where you change four buses. I was walking for about half a kilometer. And I'm in the middle of nowhere in terms of, you know, it, it's fields and dusty road. There is not even a tar road there. And I was asking myself, why the hell am I doing this? And I think at that point, the, uh, you know, I had tears in my eyes because it was just tough. It was not an easy phase. And the answer that came is that if, if you know, any one of us has to uh, look at what a middle class student's aspirations would be, right? Have a good house, whatever, right? A BMW or a Merc or this or that, you know, if we just follow our own path, whichever way it is out of our college, we would get there. But uh, I was very sure that there is no one who will come to this college to teach this course for 5,000 bucks for like a six month program. So it did, it was very clear that if we do this, it may make a difference in someone else's life. It may not change our life in any which way. And I actually have seen that story play out in a huge way. Uh, you know, we had hyperverge and you know, it got funded in the Valley, et cetera. So actually nothing changed in my life. Even if I would have taken a path into Bay Area as a job or something like that, it would have led me maybe to the same place. This path also led me to the same place. But the joy today is when we look at students, right? There are so many students of Lemma Labs who completed their masters, who completed their PhDs, who are now professors in US universities. And, and that's, I think, the true joy of entrepreneurship for me. So even at Hyperverge, the conversation was the same, right? We had six months of money left, uh, no more ideas around B2C. And we had like a 15 kind of a mill acquisition uh, opportunity, right? Like AWA, uh, Amazon and Alibaba, et cetera, were reaching out. So, so, and it was a 13 member team. So the choice was the same, right? If we, if we choose to go that way, maybe we'll all make a few million dollars. Everyone in the team will maybe make quarter million dollars. If we choose the other way, where we choose to build an institution, uh, maybe nothing will change in our life, but something can change in someone else's life. So it has always been at the main crossroads. It's always that choice uh, that I encounter. Brilliant. Actually, I just want to now connect, as uh, Suresh was saying, I connect the dots. I'll just go back to Hemant and say, if you were around and uh, Keda was walking uh, from campus to some remote kind of institute, how would you change his life today? 
with your with your platform him um yeah well like i said earlier uh, you know if, if it is with my platform specifically right uh, you know then uh, you know, perhaps take a take a drone to do photogrammetry and then recreate uh, a virtual lab and uh, you know bring in the digital equivalence of uh, the products that kedar has and enable him to have give a like a realistic in person like experience to those students uh, at uh, you know who are his lima labs uh, customers right or users um, yeah you know it's and it's actually quite simple today to do it so himant would you echo the same statement that kedar made for you also it's a journey it's all about giving back and making an impact You, you can be honest. You can be honest. You have obviously it's you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, uh, well, uh, about giving back, well, certainly, right? Uh, you know, I don't know if I have accrued so much to give back yet, but as a as a part of my journey, I certainly echo what what Kedar mentioned that uh, you know, as you know, the, you know, during the entrepreneurship, uh, it's important that you enjoy what you're doing day in and day out, and when you're doing it, if you can bring that joy to others in your team as well. right to to begin with after you right uh, and then to the end customers there's nothing the, that satisfies beyond that right uh, you know money is probably secondary uh, and that too if uh, what you're doing is uh, is innovative is solving a real problem out there and you're enjoying the work and you're ensuring your team enjoys the work and your first few customers enjoy what you've delivered right uh, you know money will flow in at some stage right uh, so that's what i truly believe in uh, and i i well i uh, ran a startup called dressy for about 5 years we shut it down this was a virtual fitting room that we started in 2012 which before microsoft kinect was launched so we created our own computer vision algorithms and all of that where we uh, recognized human body and you know gave this whole virtual trial experience this actually stemmed from an idea of uh, getting into a sari showroom you know heard uh, what problems that sari showroom retailers have in an unorganized market and all that uh, took up the challenge uh, you know i was in hyderabad I, in 2011 i landed here in 2011 because my wife took up a like a you know admission here in a college here um, so i had no other choice but to be here now uh, you know not that i am uh, super connected to hyderabad then but i am now connected to hyderabad right so then it was just uh, when i was here the there was a problem statement which uh, i realized that people uh, you know had a, a real problem of which is trying out sarees and the team that i started working with mostly interns because we didn't really uh, have much support beyond a small support that triple it gave us so triple it uh, has started an incubator i think in 2011 and 2012 so they reached out to us they gave us a grant which actually certainly helped us a lot in creating that initial team right uh, and then uh, for us to sustain we couldn't really go after uh, a lot of senior folks senior engineers where we could pay them good money but uh, i'm i'm super proud till date today that even when i did not raise any money i was always ensuring that i paid salaries on time to everybody right uh, when i said time you know in the first 0 to 10 days of the month right uh, you know sometimes it will be like beyond fifth day but we did ensure that we always paid salaries so there are some fundamentals that always i stuck to right uh, where team should be happy and the uh, the kind of work that they that they should do should be like interesting right uh, and we went on to do it you know we could not uh, you know scale up that first model and we shut it down in 2016 and started this new venture in the metaverse space right uh, uh, and i i believe in this now in terms of giving back uh, certainly uh, you know uh, believe in uh, helping the society around where i uh, grew up in right uh, as a uh, you know i for for that matter I, I i'm trying to sort of reconnect with tirupati and shrikala sri to try the uh, to promote the ecosystem there to promote entrepreneurship in tirupati area which is where i grew up i grew up in shrikala sri uh, you know trying to do a lot of activities in that region as well thanks hemant i know you're doing a lot for the temple also uh, along with iit uh, tirupati and your platform and uh, this is really cool stuff so now i wanted to actually uh, jump over to narsama narsama what do you think uh, can happen to kind of ignite the hyderabad ecosystem for entrepreneurship because we been at it for a while i mean and a lot of good things have happened in the form of thub isb triple it iit a lot of institutes have come up obviously there's tai there's hisia and a variety of uh, kind of uh, other entrepreneurial groups so what is it that's missing in your mind 
No, I think, um, so obviously, um, we, it has evolved a lot. I lived in Hyderabad uh, for a few years, uh, back in 2010 to 2012. From then till today, I would say if I have to look at the evolution, it has evolved a lot. And a lot of SaaS companies also have been put shop in Hyderabad, right? Be it the likes of Zenoti, Dubinbox, um, or even uh, I think Gainsight also has a big office in Hyderabad. So a lot of SaaS companies also have put shops there. And uh, we also opened an office in Hyderabad last year. Uh, that was the first office outside Bangalore that we opened uh, uh, you know, last year, right? So if I have to look at probably the missing pieces, so it, if I have to look at the way it happened in our college, right? Like we just chose the path what our seniors have chosen most of the times, right? So if I have to look at, let's say you, like the likes of you or someone else who has been in Hyderabad, educating Hyderabad. So we just chose the path what our seniors took in our colleges. And then I think that's what is happening even today when you're outside in the world, like people are looking up to what people have done. So I, if I have to look at it, probably some people like you are the ones who are essentially trying to drive entrepreneurship in Hyderabad. People have to realize that we can build companies sort of anywhere in the world today. Uh, you know, it was not pre-COVID, there was a notion that, you know, you can only build companies in Bangalore, you can only build companies in Hyderabad, uh, Delhi or Gurgaon and so on, where most of the startups are born. But today we have realized that there is no requirement of a physical location to be honest to build companies. And I think that relation is happening more and more in the last two years. I've, like we have set shops in Hyderabad, I think a lot of companies are already setting shops in Hyderabad. I believe it's a matter of time that it will go from where it is today to in the next 10, 10 years or 15 years, right? The infrastructure has been great. I mean, while we don't like to say it, Bangalore infrastructure, right? So uh, Hyderabad, unfortunately, uh, with all good leaders have been able to build really good infrastructure as well, which is essential for any city to grow to bring in employment for a lot of more people. So I think uh, it's, I feel it's a matter of time. Uh, it is going to grow much larger than what it is in the last, dec last one decade. Well, I think uh, following up, I just need to request you to kind of spread the good news about Hyderabad outside, grow your Hyderabad office, make yeah. it happen here. That, that would be very, very good for the ecosystem. Uh, Kedar, your views, uh, I mean, why why is Bangalore so hot, even despite the infrastructure that sucks big time? I think Bangalore is getting too hot to handle for most folks. <laughs> 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 and everyone would agree to me. I think uh, just think about salary benchmarks. Everything is going crazy, not just in Bangalore, in India itself. Uh, so, uh, Shikant, we were in Chennai before. And at that point, uh, the time when we decided to move to... Uh, Bangalore was where we were finding it very difficult to get maybe software development engineers, etc. And that was the reason to move to Bangalore because there was some ecosystem there. But today's India is totally different, right? I'm still talking 2015. Today, if we see, I think we have, uh, especially with COVID, you know, there are people who are joining uh, from so many different places, right? Assam, etc, etc. And they are doing phenomenal job in terms of what they're able to achieve as outcomes. So I definitely feel that uh, uh, Hyderabad will definitely go grow because it has amazing infrastructure. You enjoy driving here. Uh, uh, if I come to financial district, it doesn't look like India. It looks like some other country altogether. So it, it's it. There is a lot of thought that has gone into creating infrastructure, which is definitely going to attract a lot of companies. Uh, and I do feel very positive about India per se, right? Not just uh, Hyderabad. Maybe a lot of the tier twos that are around Hyderabad also, right? Which are which are maybe about one night away from Hyderabad or about three, four hours drive from Hyderabad. There's a good scope of growth there as well, because uh, you know we are all going to find software development engineers or different functions, right? You know, one step away and one step away and one step away. Thanks, thanks, Kedar. I'll just take a small minute uh, on some hygiene. Uh, is, hi, Shri, are you there? Can you uh, put up your hand? Shri Pandey? I don't see her on the phone. Oh, Shivani, she's also not there? Uh, neither her. Okay, great. No, actually, I just wanted to also announce that everyone can start using the chat feature to ask questions. And then Vamsi will probably read them out to the panel. Uh, I just wanted to have one last question, Hemant. Hemant, one, one key thing about you is you actually spent a lot of time in the state, right? 
uh, as well combined Andhra Pradesh, now Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and things like that. Uh, how do you think you can actually make a, I mean, you're already working uh, some uh, universities, small colleges, schools. W what is missing today? I mean, it, because the government is so super proactive here. They, they've done a phenomenal job. I mean, especially the Telangana government in terms of the infrastructure that all of us are talking about. But what is missing? I mean, is are all the components together where we can actually start to see this entire thing grow the way we want to see it grow? Yeah, I think... Um... I think I have no, I actually have no complaints uh, for Hyderabad, right? Uh, so many things in Hyderabad, like you mentioned, right? The government has done a lot of things for the ecosystem here, starting from T-Hub, right? So T-Hub, uh, you know, which is a, a like a child that sort of grew up in Triple E, but with government support, Telangana support, right? It's, uh, it's immense. It's a, it's a great, uh, I would say, case study on how government has created the, the largest, perhaps the largest uh, startup incubator in India. Right. Uh, I'm sure uh, maybe some others would not agree here, but yeah, you know, but I think uh, Hyderabad has done a lot of things uh, for the startup and an, an entrepreneurship ecosystem here. If there is anything that I want to pick, uh, uh, I could perhaps uh, say somebody who connects the dots between the government like you, right? Uh, so, you know, who could connect the dots between what the government is doing and what, uh, you know, different companies, startups are trying to do. Government is doing a lot of things like TSIAC, for instance, I think the Telangana State Innovation Council is a different body which is formed to nurture onto, uh, innovation in the uh, state, right? Uh, you know, not just uh, in, in companies uh, which are formed here, but also in colleges all across Telangana, right? So they actually take care of it. Now, there also already come startups who are working in this space. So maybe if uh, there could be some you know, matchmaker who could sort of uh, you know, connect them better uh, and get these solutions more commercialized, right? Uh, that would, I, th I think, take the whole innovation you know, out of the state and to the world. So cool. Uh, so uh, yeah. what I'll do right now is, I'll just go quickly across all three of you. Hemant, what does entrepreneurship mean to you? Well, creating uh, new, uh, new solutions for problems that have never been solved. Thanks. Either. Quick, one line quick, what, what is entrepreneurship to you? It's uh, two things. One is conscious business and uh, contribution. Arsama, your turn. I, I feel it different probably. It's, it's about the joy that you can have while you build something and, about, and creating a lot of opportunities for people that work for you to create something. So thank you. Thank you. So with that, I think I'll leave it on. Srikant, I'd love to hear your views on entrepreneurship as well, given your vast experience. Mine is a slightly different story, uh, Suresh, because when I did my first startup, it was 1991, it was in the Valley, right? And I didn't even know what a VC was. So actually, I bootstrapped my way into my first startup and got funding accidentally in the middle, right? So everything was bootstrapped, everything was learned. It was a nine-year journey, which ended well because we were able to exit despite the dot-com. Uh, bust, as we call it at that time, boom and bust. And uh, so everything to me has actually come from this whole thing about conscious business, making sure that I'm very careful about capital, uh, conservative, make sure that we have good governance in place, make sure that we always pay people their salaries, make sure that we don't kind of uh, screw around with provident fund and all that kind of uh, stuff that people are not uh, careful about, which could get, land them into trouble. And obviously you scale up, you build, the key thing is, if you don't surround yourself with good talent very early on, you will struggle. And whenever we have lost some, some of the talent, it has been actually difficult. So keeping that culture together. So even after, I think 1991 was when I did my first startup. It's about 31 years later. They still have a WhatsApp group. They still have an annual picnic. And if I'm not there, they will still have my photograph there or whoever is not there, right? So, so it's, it's very important. I mean, this whole thing is, you're doing it because it comes from within, there's a passion and you're still able to solve a problem. And in doing so, make sure that you create something that's of value. When I say value, both from a business standpoint, both from a creation standpoint, both, I wouldn't say call it accomplishment because everything else is a side effect. But like once you see something which you've built, remain there, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. When I joined a, a persistent system uh, during our series A round as a chief operating officer, Anand was a founder. He still is a founder, 
and his journey is 31, 32 years old, right? And so, so is Sridhar Vembu. So some people follow that course and Kedar is following that course. Some people actually kind of say, you know what, I need expertise and I actually need funding, which, which is actually correct. If you look at the AR, VR space, mm. unless we get some decent funding for him, and he will not be able to make that progress, right? Yeah. A persistent systems was easy or writing a DevOps platform that I did earlier was easy or writing a pure software platform is easy. Then you actually find ways to actually scale up, right? Yeah. But if you have uh, something like an AR, VR, which is like a tech touch point, it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. But uh, from that perspective, you have to choose good money. When I say good money, means whoever is com coming in to invest in you. Like I'll give an example. I, I the team from Mo Engage caught my attention as soon as they started, which was 2013, right? And I saw some spark in them. I like their approach from a tech perspective, where they're thinking about an SDK that could be embedded in a, an APK, which was mobile app, and could actually track events. And this is not the approach that other people are using, right? Or get Postman, for example, who are just focused on API testing, or Hasur or Tanmay. We, we could have got him here today, today also, but like I think he's an SFO. He's just finished his hundred million dollar round. But these are these are things which, uh, I mean, you have to have the right combination. Like in, in Tanmay's case, he got Nexus. Nexus focuses on these kind of products, right? And they were able to kind of give him a lot of surround sound help. If you were to look at uh, more engaged, I think the subsequent rounds, especially when you talk about matrix partners and um, multiples, et cetera, coming in, they've actually given, uh, expanded the network in terms of being able to hire easily and scale easily and get some outside in thinking, which is very critical when you're doing a SaaS product, even though he got the product pricing right. But I think there's lots of other things that a good investor provides. Whereas if you look at Kedar, he's gone with one story and he's seeing success. I always think that at some point in time, he will take in some capital, but not today. But to me, I think it's the journey, which is very important. It's not so much the milestones. I mean, you keep on building and you build forever, right? And that's basically what this book is about, because these are journeys which will never stop. They'll continue to kind of make an impact. And I hope that that's the same thing that the entire Hyderabad ecosystem can do uh, with your help, uh, especially Thai Hyderabad, and T-Hub, which is what T-Hub was designed to do, and uh, CIE, Triple ID Hyderabad, the IIT, Hyderabad Incubators, and ISB. When you wrote this book and you kind of talked to all the 16 entrepreneurs and reviewed their journeys and participated in creating that book, what are the commonalities that you think uh, struck you? Are there any patterns? Are all of these journeys unique in so many different ways that there is no commonality for an investor to pick the right entrepreneur or for an entrepreneur to choose his own journey, right? Do you see anything there uh, in terms of when you wrote the book, uh, Srikant? So actually, so there are two, two lenses I'll, I'll look at answering this question. One is the investor lens, right? Yeah. From an investor lens, I think most of the journeys were about a large market, a passionate team, yeah. and some minimal traction, right? This is from an investor standpoint. But from an entrepreneurial standpoint, the patterns that I saw was basically, they were super passionate. They were not ready to give up. Yeah. Uh, they were reasonably open. I'm saying reasonably open, okay? In, in terms of receiving inputs, because sometimes you don't want to receive bad inputs too. Yeah. So they were able to filter it out, come back, make changes, right? So all these things are good. Because, and, and the interesting thing is a lot of the core team yeah. that they created stuck together and went on to do a lot more. Like uh, Kedar was pointing out, my first startup, there were like at least 11 startups that happened from there. And some of them were more successful than mine, yeah. to be honest, in terms of how, how large they were and how much they got, got acquired for. So that's always a matter of pride. So I think I saw that consistent pattern. If you look at like say, Ease My Trip. Ease My Trip was a brilliant story. It's in a, it, it's in a crowded space. And in comes Prashant P Pitti and his two brothers. It's all in the family. And they scale it up from scratch and they go IPO yeah. and they're doing a bang up job. And so it's all about that, right? Yeah. So that's the main thing that I saw. And they were never uh, deterred by failure. It's at least I know, uh, and I've seen the more engaged journey. I've seen the hyperword story this year. And I've seen him and two struggle at times, right? They never gave up. They kept on moving ahead. So that, that's what I would say is the biggest thing. 
Yeah, I'll ask one more question and then hand it over. Uh, sure. When you think about some of the students who are in their uh, final year or kind of, you know, senior year, trying to figure out if entrepreneurship is the right path for them, uh, this just seem to be a little bit of a challenge for many of them. Should they take the more easy and convenient path out into building their career? How should they think about entrepreneurship? But somewhere in their mind and body, they seem to have that bug to do something on their own, right? So what advice would you guys have? Uh, especially, Kedar, you've been, I guess, right from first year or second year, you've been onto it. Uh, how should people consider that? How should they evaluate that? Can they do some sample testing? Can they do some basic litmus testing to say, hey, I'm really an entrepreneur. No, no, I'm actually more fit for large corporates. How do they make a distinction? Uh, I have not been in all shoes, so I, I yeah. cannot uh, tell about, you know, how a person feels that I should be in a large corporate. Yeah. But one thing uh, I definitely feel is there need not be any fear about entrepreneurship because I, especially coming out of college and trying to become an entrepreneur, today India looks like a great place. Lot of funding, more funding than you would uh, like. And, uh, but it was, it was very different back then, very limited amount of funding. As Shrikan said, most of us hadn't heard about what an angel or what a VC is. Uh, I had a very good lecture by a professor called Sunil Handa. He's a prof at IIM Ahmedabad and he's a very successful entrepreneur. And he, for everyone, especially from college, right, who feels, hey, what if it doesn't work out or what if it fails? He, he told his story, which is a brilliant story. His sixth idea after coming out of I am Ahmedabad was to uh, buy potatoes in India and sell it in Jordan. And the shipment got delayed. And those potatoes developed hands and legs by the time they reached Jordan. So this is his sixth idea that did not work out. But the seventh idea that worked out was, I think, Core Amlaj. And that became a few thousand crores business. He mentioned about his student uh, who was trying to sell organic fertilizers. And you know, after four years of working very hard selling organic fertilizers, he got to a place where the net profit was like 40 lakhs per year. And one thing that stuck him while meeting all farmers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is that he's doing this, this is working, but there is a bigger opportunity. He saw that sugar refining is all done by politicians, etc., no high quality equipment. And why don't we get the best equipment and solve this problem? And he started doing that and that became uh, Renuka Sugars, which is again, few thousand crores business. So what I learned from those stories is that entrepreneurship is like a lifestyle. Like you join an army or you join a Navy or Air Force. You have to choose it like a lifestyle. And, you know, we are all going to struggle through it. Uh, Hemant mentioned about uh, his journey. I have had Lema Lab journey. All, all these journeys are never like, you know, up and up and up hockey stick. Uh, but finally, if you choose it as a lifestyle, at some point, something works out and uh, and then it's a big success. Yeah. So almost entrepreneurship is a career on its own. It might be the first one, it could be the second one, it could be the sixth one, right? Yeah. yeah. In, any other thoughts from Narsimha or Hemant or Srikant? Yeah, I think Kedra has put it right. Um, while at, so today I see India has seen successful startups, right? So everyone has something in their mind that can I be so successful as some other people, right? Because I think when we passed out back in 2009, 2010, I don't think there were many success stories or rather very minimal, right? Like one, uh, like Shrikant, who's like probably have done it like in 1990s or maybe Ashish who, who is again Shrikant's colleague who has done it probably in 1990s, but very, very minimal handful of them today, there are a lot of success stories. So there's always you now on the back of the mind for people that can I do this and become as successful as, it is, as someone else has become, right? So I think don't we should not take that lens. We should take are you passionate of doing something on your own through which you can build through the residence for years, right? Like even mowing edge had a lot of hiccups. It's not, it was not an easy journey for us. I think between 2015 to 2018, when there were there were no very few investors in funding sales companies. Today, SaaS is one of the hot sector for a lot of investors. But I think 2015, 2018, not a single investor was trying to look at SaaS or very few. Um, and we had to go through all the hiccups. And we were proud that we were almost profitable back then. I have a lot of respect for Kedar, what he has done in terms of being able to do bootstrap for such a long time. It was not, it's not an easy job. 
it's it takes a lot of courage it takes a lot of uh, you know passion and energy to be resilient that you will build that what you want to build in a way that you want to right? so it's it's i think it's a lot of courage a lot of uh, passion and a lot of energy required to be an entrepreneur i would say a lot of people today has that looking at the success that other people have been able to deliver in the ecosystem and i wish i would see more more of them sooner than later i think the one point i'd like to add suresh is i think the entire ecosystem is a lot more accepting yeah uh, about people trying this out because at the end of the day i tell kids right when they are in the final year yeah a couple of years is not going to hurt you yeah and if you really want to be an entrepreneur go join a startup right do it's a much better than doing a traditional mba immediately because you get to see a whole bunch of things and then you can decide hey this is too tough for me it's i'm not cut out for it right so there are a lot of things that you can actually try out because more startups today and if you're smart you will get absorbed by them you get mentored very quickly because you're seeing everything happen in front of your eyes as opposed to working for a larger company right because a corporate job is a corporate job because you'll be given something to do and that's all you'll focus on so i think it's better to join a startup initially think of it as an extension of your learning from your college days right yeah. and i think i think that will make a huge impact i i completely agree with you and i think a uh, lot of startups typically or a lot of first generation entrepreneurs typically fail because of lack of learning and a startup will deliver will deliver the training that is required So Suresh, you may, you may want to uh, you may want to have uh, uh, to address the questions if there are some questions. Or... Yeah, there are a couple in the chat here. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe I know uh, Kedar Hemant have answered this, but maybe you want to provide some more color, Srikant, on this. The question is: uh, despite uh, all that you have said, Hyderabad has not produced as many unicorns as Bangalore or Delhi. What are the three things that will make Hyderabad, the more exciting startup ecosystem. How do we get uh, Telangana on the map? Is kind of the question. I guess that's been on everybody's mind, but things are changing. But love to hear from you, Srikant. Yeah, my 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 philosophy is slightly different, right? You can you can advertise all you want. You can set up institutes. You can kind of make all these kind of programs run, right? But unless the entire city is a buzz, in terms of okay, let's kind of work together with seniors, juniors. it has to be almost like a workshop because what what got me going in the valley i was i was there in 1991 all i had to do was walk to stanford or berkeley sit down there observe things so many things happening right here what's happened is we do it in formal ways we do events right but it's not a continuous buzz that's very critical the other thing is the folks who are leading these things have have to actually be very very aware of what's going on right say in every 5 years things change a lot right Yeah. So if I were to kind of have a discussion with someone in ER, we are in 2012, 10. I won't find any senior guy even to be able to talk to me, right? What I what I envision in my mind, right? That's changing. So everything is getting compressed. When everything is getting compressed, and you have a good infrastructure, and and you should have the leadership in all these institutes, whether it's TH or whether it's whether it's TI or whether it's HICR, which which is actually thinking forward. Yeah. I think that that magic will happen because all the ingredients are there. and it, and i think we should forget about these stats we are number 1 number 2 number 3 right yeah. if we get like about six or seven really good things to happen yeah. it will automatically take off and, and the one thought that comes and people have said this to me also srikant is see for example folks like heman then kedar and narsimha if they are able to dedicate four to six hours a month and mentor and coach some of the startups early on in the mode of a workshop as you said srikant I think that buzz will generally get created. I don't want to put you guys on spot, but I'm sure you're doing it in your own time. But a little bit more coming from people who have crossed a certain stage, I think will have a huge impact on the ecosystem. So you have this book here, right? Yeah. I'm sure at least ten to twelve of these entrepreneurs, and we're going to be adding a few more like Narasimha and Tarun from Ether Energy, as well as Ajayan from Darwin Box. these are these folks are all available and today with the virtual thing right you can actually have these meet and greets and then what you should do is immediately follow it up with some interactions because when i mentor i mentor in a multiple cycles i mean it's not just one touch point yeah so they have to come back and then then we interact so i think a lot of that is happening i'm not saying it's not happening 
But a lot of people are very impatient. They just say, if we build a building and call it X, something will happen. It does not happen. Okay. No, no, I'm going to reach to all three of them. We do what is known as open mic on the last working day of every month. And I think this one is on uh, March 31st. One of you could come and talk for 10 minutes. And then more importantly, the startups asking you guys questions about their business and your interaction with them, I think in a workshop style, will have a huge impact to them. So I'll sign you up, guys. i will automatically take the liberty on that. Suresh sir, I'll just add an input. I think today's world is so easy. I actually trouble Narsimha so much. Like, you know, <laughs> dropping mails. Oh, my team has started troubling him to the point I started telling them, don't trouble him so much because I am already <laughs> reaching out to him. So, see, today it is such that, uh, and this is still my college senior, right? So I have all right to maybe go and knock his door like I would do in during hostel time. But today, in fact, there is so much guidance available, right? It links just simple. It just takes a LinkedIn message or a thoughtful email uh, to be sent out to someone. And usually you get a response. And uh, just giving an example, if we are setting up a new function, uh, our, you know, we usually directly, right? Either I or one of my co-founders will write to maybe four or five leaders who have done a phenomenal job at that. Uh, so and and mostly you will hear back from almost all of them uh, because everyone wants to give back someone is giving back to them in terms of helping out etc so everyone will take out some time when they have time and it's so it is not that difficult at all it is just just a little hustle which yeah. i feel every entrepreneur should do yeah. being able to drop a thoughtful whatsapp email uh, yeah. not just one maybe a follow up uh, you know yeah. couple of times and they will get through always not just to me anyone anyone out there today because you guys have interacted with the ecosystem and you've been uh, in this whole journey what should the ecosystem players like thehub and tai and icr do better are there things that we can do better to uh, enable the next gen of entrepreneurs right yeah, see, uh, uh, personally, uh, Suresh, uh, uh, I got a lot from Thai ISB events that used to happen in 2011, yeah. 2012, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I heard Vikram speak at, uh, at I think, 2011 or 2012 event, Vikram Gopala from Nephro. Yeah. Yeah. It was a huge inspiration for me then, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so I think those events like uh, Srikant mentioned, right? If you keep that buzz going on, you know, across so many organizations which are already there, I, I understand today's event, is a T-Hub and Thai uh, you know, combined uh, you know, event, right? Yes. So with so many uh, organizations available here, if you can uh, you know, create a, you know, a, some sort of a plan to ensure that buzz continues to happen where you know, startups can come in, mingle across all these so, events. So can we do, can we beta test your product, Hemant, to do this? <laughs> uh, absolutely. absolutely so uh so yeah so that that's what uh you know uh, you know i could think of as, as one uh you know idea here the second one that i see missing is you know opportunity to uh you know get investments right it could be minor investments as well for a lot of startups uh, uh if they are given those uh in that exposure in uh events led by thai you know, t-hub or other organizations uh, where we can create that uh, continuum, right? Uh, of uh, uh, where people can come in, you know, pitch and raise funds. Uh, I think that would sort of uh, boost a lot of uh, people who are staying on the edge to come in. Hey, like like Shark Tank, Shark Tank, right? Like you know, come in, you know, get to one of these events, pitch the idea, show progress, and then raise money. Yeah, I, I think this is an important point, uh, uh, Suresh. It's less to do with Shark Tank. I think what's happening now is we're getting a few more funds that are being set up, right? I'm not, right. not just talking about T fund or maybe Startup India fund and all that, but there are a lot of private uh, kind of funds being set up, right? From CAT 1 to CAT 2 and all that. Right. And I think that will have an impact on the ecosystem because yeah. whether you like it or not, uh, Hyderabad has a fantastic infrastructure compared to Bangalore. So there is going to be overflow from Bangalore here. If, if there is an investment infrastructure here and everything else is fine, people will move here. Yeah. Give it time. I think everyone keeps on saying who's going to come first, who's going to come second. Who? The way I look at it is like, it's all about India, man. Why is it only about Hyderabad? Fine, we're talking about Hyderabad today. Yeah. yeah. No, I want to hand it back to you, Srikanth. I didn't want to uh, ask too many questions, but I thought these are uh, things that were kind of interesting for everyone. 
Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so uh, I, I think uh, the floor is open for any more questions. And if you can also unmute it because we have about 15 minutes. Whoever wants to actually just raise their hands and get unmuted, you can actually ask questions to the panelists. Please go ahead. I would request the audience to use the raise hand option so that we can give you the privileges to unmute. Going once. Oh, you should see an option called reactions. And you should see an option called raise, More raise hand options. Someone has asked. Okay. okay. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Maybe you can start with that. Somebody unmuting themselves and talk. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Karthik. Actually, I'm from Hyderabad. <clears throat> So I have been selected for the panelist of the uh, recent uh, startup thing, uh, Save Log. I have a spawn question, sir. Like uh, we have been like uh, bringing up a lot of opportunities for the startups, uh, creating awareness. Why these lessons aren't included into academics, like in the schools or in the colleges? Why not include in that? So that's where actually the roots getting to grow, right? That's my small question, actually. Okay, so Suresh, you gonna answer that or can I answer it as a prof? Yeah, yeah, you should answer it. <laughs> so I wear my professor's hat. Uh, the problem is with our education system, which is still very rigid. I mean, there were good intentions. AICT put certain guide rails in place and this is what engineering should be. This is what computer science should be. This is what, and as um, Hemant was pointing out earlier, things are changing. And I think every institute has an entrepreneurial cell. But who can teach entrepreneurship? It can't be taught by someone who's not been an entrepreneur, right? So I think that's what needs to be integrated back into the system. Uh, that's what Hemant was saying. Let's create a buzz, get some folks around. So for example, if your college has a famous alum who's actually gone out and done something, invite them, have those interactions because from there is when these electives are going to be built out in terms of, okay, what does real entrepreneurship mean? Can we actually go to a small project? It's not thought of like that today, but uh, we have actually put in a lot of proposals to AICT. Let's hope they consider it because they're also going through a digital cu curriculum. I'm hoping that whatever Hemant is creating becomes part of that. So we can actually have a lot of actual real world experience in terms of, okay, see, this is what a balance sheet looks like. This is what a contract looks like. Don't make these mistakes. This is, this is These are the mistakes that I made. So all those things are very important as opposed to just theoretically knowing about accounting or finance. Yeah. And also there is a fair amount of work that is being done by nonprofit organizations like ours. We have a Thai grad program where we sign up with the university and we run a six to seven month program with the university students, two different modules on the business plan, go to market strategies, pricing, etc. And then there is a business plan competition at the college level. So we have 30 of those. And I know that T-Hub also does a similar program. And I think they have been quite successful as well. So there are things in place, and I think each university is now also mandated to by the government to do some of these initiatives. So things are changing, and I think they're changing reasonably quickly as well. And every one of the uh, universities is looking at this seriously, and students do have an option to do this, some virtual, some physical. So things are changing, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Google Boy, I hope, hope that answered your question. Okay, he says it's hope it gets it soon. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. There's one, there's one hand up. Pujari, Jay Vardhan Sai, I have given you the privileges to unmute. Uh, yes, sir. So my question is like, uh, so uh, presently on, on this ongoing, uh, like ongoing market, so there are many software companies which are based out of uh, every technology surrounded with every technologies where a new technology come in, they acquire it and they start doing so much of things on it. And uh, it's very easy for them to implement the technology whenever it is in the open market, whenever it is, which is in the high demand. So if we are trying to start a new startup company like Kedar has started the AI based. So there, there are some new companies which are coming out based out of technology, which is great to have. But how can we how can we start a startup using a technology company and being a technology company and being a small player? How can we evolve in the 
huge market where already the software companies like TCS, HCL, and uh, Wipro are uh, already take over the took over the Indian market. If you see in the Indian perspective, so how can we develop in the Indian market where all the among the big players like if we are deemed to if we are going to do a SaaS business, like how can we how can we grow ourselves in this huge marketplace, like. Uh, like one point acquiring the uh, customers, like customers don't come to us. We have to reach out them. Like in, in this huge market of uh, big, big companies, how can we reach out them to ask, asking them to provide us a chance to support you? So, so I, I, I'll answer that from one angle. Number one, it's uh, wrong to kind, kind of compare next generation startups with the TCOs or HCO, anything like that, because I was uh, a CTO at HCL, I was a CTO at Cognizant, so I know exactly how they approach things. They're more like services solution oriented companies. They may have some small elements of SaaS offerings, but what we're talking about is actually two kinds of technologies, right? Technology company. One is if you have a horizontal platform and then you apply it to certain verticals, like Kedar is doing to kind of financial services, or if you look at what Hemant is doing, he's building this whole AR, VR uh, kind of meeting room where assets can be brought in by makers, and you can actually build a nice customer interaction center virtually. These things are not done at uh, 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 TCS or uh, Tech Mahindra, et cetera, as their daily bread. They're more services oriented. You're right. If you are doing a B2B business, it is very difficult to kind of sell to enterprise customers in India. Much more difficult before. Now it's becoming a little easier, but it is not easy. I mean, everyone will tell you that from Hemant to Narsama to obviously Kedar. Uh, let them talk through that because they are doing it today. I did it maybe like 20 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, but like uh, you should hear it from them. So uh, can you talk about customer acquisition, perhaps, Keda? I'll talk about early stage customer acquisition because that I think is the most difficult. So I remember when we decided that we want to build it on revenue, uh, Sridhar gave us one simple advice and that served us very good. Uh, this year you need to make half a million dollars. And you need to make it not through many clients who pay $10,000. You need to make it through two clients who pay quarter million dollars each. So that got me thinking who the hell will pay us quarter million dollars and for what? And that thinking was led us to wherever there are 100 million images. You know, we all have some strengths, right? Coming from Moing Edge team, they have deeply looked at one problem, which is where they have a lot of strength. Uh, Hemant has a lot of strength in the area that he has looked at. So for us, it was always images. If you wake me up at 3 a.m. and ask me computer vision or machine learning, I can, uh, you know, that that is where we came from through college days and all. So our thesis was that wherever there are 100 million images, people will listen to us because we will have the accuracies. It takes a huge, uh, you know, there's a huge difference between being 90% accurate, 95% accurate and 99% accurate. And at 100 million, these differences amplify in a huge way. So the point of sharing this is you will have something that's a strength of yours in terms of either domain understanding, technology understanding, et cetera. The second thing that you need to marry it with that someone who is spending quarter million dollars should have at least maybe $2 million of benefit or whatever amount you are looking at to gain, how will they benefit? And that is best learned by actually 90% of what we did was taught to us by our customers. We knew, we went to them telling we, we are good at this. And then we actually sat out of their offices for two months, three months. In certain cases, we have spent like my co-founder spent a year in Vietnam at a client's place where we built out the entire KYC and fraud engine. And 90% of the learning actually came from our client. And that became the first million dollar paying client and it, it innovates a round of funding. So see, and these are advantages that a TCS or a Cognizant don't have, right? Like the founders are not going and sitting in an organization trying to solve a business problem. So first thing I would point out is identify what strength you have. Uh, identity, go and be very open to listening to what is the business problem that someone has. And finally, as much as we say that we are technology companies, no one, none of us could be here if we are not solving a business problem. So like Narsima mentioned, he is company solving a problem that helps people increase revenue. So we all have to finally get to the nuts and bolts of the business problem and do whatever it takes from the technology side to solve it, right? And, and, and that's usually the approach that I've seen work for a lot of people. 
Yeah, and I, I can't agree more on uh, on that either. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, so for me, the number was uh, with one zero less, right? <laughs> right. So where uh, you know my investor said, you know, always uh, uh, you know pursue uh, uh, deals in very early stage. Uh, that was at least twenty thousand dollars for a pilot, right? Uh, never do anything for like thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. You know, then they're just taking you for a ride, right? Uh, uh, the uh, the other thing that I uh, you know wanted to talk about talk is uh, like I think Pujari right Pujari driver then huh um, it's not necessary that uh, you know you always try and create a new technology all the time right uh, and when you're saying that hey AWS probably already has it Azure already has it Infosys may have it or some other company has it like everybody is solving all these problems right you know AI was probably uh, you know, too difficult like 10 years ago. But now maybe it's available as a service as well, right? Like so is AR, VR, everything else as well. Uh, but I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for you to play in the way you present it uh, based on your target customers, right? Now it's probably the, like uh, the recently there was this uh, clubhouse, right? Now what is clubhouse underneath, right? It's the same, you know, audio conferencing, but in different rooms. It Zoom already had breakout rooms, uh, but you have to create a breakout room, go there and talk, you know, switch off your videos, and you can talk, uh, you know, in Zoom breakout rooms as well. But how did uh, you know, Clubhouse become an overnight sensation? You know, is it because of you know, suddenly they came up with a new technology? No, you know, it's a different way of how they package the whole technology and then brought to the uh, to and, and to the identified uh, target uh, user site. So that's what you know uh, you know you may have to do often than inventing new tech uh, or worried about uh, tech being developed by somebody else. Thank you. Well said, Iman. Thank you. Thank you, Kedar. So I guess we're kind of close to 7.30 now, uh, closing on time here. Any last uh, thoughts from each one of you uh, to the next uh, uh, generation of entrepreneurs? One thought or idea that you have that they have to watch out for or be aware of? I think I can just... Um, so a lot of times I feel entrepreneurship is also about seeing the future, right? So. Um, if you see what the world looks like, maybe five years down the line, 10 years down the line, I think that will make you a very successful entrepreneur. And uh, so that's also one trait that you can look for in yourselves, whether you really can be an entrepreneur or not. Um, so, uh, I mean, we talked about a lot of positive things, right? Uh, you know, encouraging entrepreneurship and all. I wanted to touch upon, watch out for, because you said watch out for as well, right? Uh, I, I, don't, I want people not to be too carried away with the, you know, with the fanciness uh, for some people of entrepreneurship, right? Uh, it's so super cool and all of that. Uh, you know, ensure you, you know, you have your basics met, right? Uh, you know, and and it could just be basics, right? But ensure you have those basics met, and then go chase your dreams, right? Uh, so that you know you don't repent later. Is it? Uh, yeah, I think uh, when we look at entrepreneurs on the screen, etc., I've been uh, to so many talks, we feel like, you know, what a life. So I would tell you that it's very painful as a journey. It is very challenging as a journey. Uh, it is, uh, you know, anyone who is doing it for money, power, etc., that is the first thing that will go out of the window in the first month itself, right? You will be begging and uh, reaching out to so many people if there is a uh, you know, if there is a cup left uh, by someone who had tea and did not bother to throw it, you will be the person taking it to the sink. So, so find a reason for yourself to be an entrepreneur, which is beyond money, beyond power. You know, like we mentioned about passion. Uh, you know, trying to make a change in the world or trying to solve a problem, trying to make opportunities happen for people. Something else has to drive you, and if that drives you, then you will be an entrepreneur. You can take it up as a lifestyle for a very long period of time. So find what that is, and you'll be a very successful entrepreneur eventually. Srikant? Suresh, I don't know. Suresh, there are a few more questions. So maybe you want to just address uh, Somebody them. asked a question on uh, somebody asked, asked a question on how do how do we cope up with stress as an entrepreneur? Now yeah. uh, perhaps Suresh or Srikant, if you want to uh, take that. Actually, my my situation is very, very different because I think it's very abnormal because uh, one year into my startup. My child had a mishap and as a result of that, he basically became a paraplegic. He's 30 years old and lives with us. And so I had extra stress where I had to actually bootstrap a company, sleep at the hospitals at night and work in the morning. 
so that was very, very difficult. It was not so much the technology that I was building, not so much the customer relationship that came easy. So it was uh, super stressful, right? I mean, because we, I had folks chasing me from the hospital with bills when they should have insurance should have covered it. At the same time, I had to actually go kind of sell, uh, hire, build. So it was super stressful. I, I, I don't wish it on anyone, but the key thing is I never gave up uh, because what was in my mind was I started this journey. So many people are with me. Let's just make sure that we are all successful and they, they get on to do successful things, right? So you have to swallow that. And, and actually go through that. Uh, but I'm sure uh, Hemant uh, and uh, Kedar, Narsama, you have your own ways to handle stress. Uh, so I think you can just mention a couple of lines on that. Uh, well, let, all right, let me go first. Uh, see, I, I think uh, it, it's good to have those connections, your friends, your mentors, uh, you know, all the time, right? Uh, you know just talk, talk to uh, people in the ecosystem or talk to people in your network, right? Uh, you know, don't, uh, I mean, not everybody can sort of excel at everything, uh, you know, especially in entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, you will eventually pick it up. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a born as an entrepreneur. You, you could eventually pick it up. But, you know, do reach out to mentors, do reach out to your friends, you know, talk about it, be open about it. Uh, don't worry about failures. Uh, and, and, and you will overcome that stress, uh, figure out solutions, and you'll move forward. But Hemant, there are there are uh, options available like inner circle support groups these days, right? Yep. Uh, so maybe uh, you can mention that uh, yep. to Thai Hyderabad, they can spread the word around. Yeah. I think Thai Hyderabad has a, uh, uh, I heard about a program, Thai Mentors, or uh, I think yeah. there's a program. Yeah, so we do like, have a mentor mentee program, which is for yeah. a full year. I think a lot of that is meant to help people share what they're going through and kind of get advice. And definitely the mentor also, depending on the situation, can bring a much larger ecosystem to help that person. So my thought, I think, is if, if you are stressed about from a business perspective, better to pick something that you really love to do. And as Kedar said, if you just think about how much money you want to make, it will definitely create stress. But if you're thinking about the problem you're solving, the passion that you have for solving the problem, maybe it's not as stressful. But yes, there is definitely stress and you should feel free to reach out to the right people. Thai, T-Hub, all of the ecosystems have that with the mentor-mentee programs and also the broader friends network, family network. Don't be shy about it. Being more open is more uh, prudent in this case. Uh, there was one last question. I think Kedar uh, had answered this for... Pujari, uh, he said, like, what is the key thing for a customer, right? Uh, to basic, let me just read this question here. Uh, what is your key selling point you say to your client to carry them for the long-term basis and keep them from not leaving you, right? So I think the key thing is if they see value in you and actually fund you in many ways, right? Uh, which is what, uh, which is what uh, Kedar was uh, talking about. Yeah. Uh, that is key because I remember my first customer remained the customer for 10 years. And then when we sold the company and some, they also said, oh, some of your people we'll, we'll employ because <laughs> we like them so much, right? So mm -hmm. I think that first two or three connects are very important. Maybe it was a little bit more traditional in, in, in my time, but I'm sure Kedar will have his own story. I'm sure Narasama will say that the very first customer they got was uh, uh, whom did you get? What's your first taxi for sure? Who were they were there? Uh, they were with us till the time they were out of App Store. So, yeah. so I think I think you're right, Shikant. As long as you create, keep creating value to the customer, you don't need to keep them. They will keep you. So, yeah, I th I think with that we'll close, uh, Srikant. The time is kind of running beyond seven thirty here. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you. yeah, thank you, thank thank you for taking the time. Take care. Good yeah, bye. and I would definitely recommend everybody to look at the IITM Nexus from a journeys perspective, the 16 journeys that you're able to read and you take some key learnings from there. So do order the book. And as Rikan said, all the proceeds are there to help someone else. So I appreciate all of you joining the call today and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, every you. one of you for wonderful insights today. I appreciate the time. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you sir. Thank you. We are now officially closing the call. Thank you. Bye-bye.